I got one of those. Okay, so anyway, I um, I did some, so I, I worked a lot in fisheries, and then I ended up at the Milford Danger Center, which is right next door to the Milford Fish Shack. And so that was a great company action of fish at the Milford Fish Hatchery, but we do do all the, the tours of the hatchery and we work closely with the biologists there at the hatchery. So, um, but I still have a, a real passion for fish. I can't walk by a stream without trying to find out what's in it, either the macroinvertebrates or the fish that are in it. So without much more ado, let's go on to um, this PowerPoint. I'll try to go through it. And um, as you know, well, okay, wait, maybe I can wait. Um, no. Okay, we can do that. No. No, we can't. Wait, wait. So much fun. And here's our third choice. That works. All right. <laughs> we can do Plan this. C. Plan C. Okay. And uh, let's just. So, okay. Appreciation for fish and discuss diversity um, and just try to make you familiar with the different kinds of fish that we do have in Kansas because we are a pretty diverse state, um, believe it or not. And then look at different fish species or not in depth or anything, but look at the relationship among fish and try to give you some clues on what are the best ways to figure out, you know, just like when you talk about birds, if you know what their beak looks like and their feet look like, you know where they can you can make some assumptions about what they where they live. Same with fish. All you need to do is look at their mouth and look at their fins. Really kind of the same part for the fish. That'll tell you a lot about where they live and how they cope with the world. And then just some gen major characteristics of fish and some basic fish principles or fish behavior. Not really a whole lot there. Um, all right. So let's talk about fish. These are cool. So fish. The most numerous vertebrates on the planet. Okay, so there are estimates in quite a bit. Um, now, Kansas here is home to 135 species of fish, but only 116 are native. So we've got some invasive or in introduced species. I won't say that they're they're all not invasive, but some of them have been introduced to Kansas waters. Now, 19 of those fish species have been introduced. And there is no species of fish that's only found in Kansas. Sorry, we just don't have anything that's totally unique to Kansas. Even though we have a shiner that's named after a city in Kansas, the Topeka Shiner, it's not just found in Kansas. And then, but, but here's the caveat, there are more kinds of fish that occur here naturally than any state further west or directly north. So north and west, we have more fish than anybody out there. But if you go south, you're going to find a lot more diversity than you are. came on weird. I don't know why that picture didn't come on, but we'll just go with that. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through some of these um, fish species. And when we look at the classes and classification of fish, we won't go to, into too much detail. But lampreys are a fish that they, they don't have jaws and they don't have these paired appendages and they're the most primitive of our living fishes. And do they relate to Kansas? Well, they do because we do have one species of lamprey, it's called the chestnut lamprey, but it's believed to be extirpated, which means that we don't feel like there are any populations of them in the state uh, now. So, um, but it's a cool fish because, well, you know, it's a it's a it's a parasite basically. They they have a, a raspy tongue. Tissue and blood of a of a fish probably a, on a some fish somewhere maybe an ocean picture or something to see them. Um, so that's what they're doing is they're they're parasites. They're feeding off of the blood and the tissue. Um, there are hagfishes are another really primitive. Pyramid. These are the most primitive of the fishes. Again, this one's mainly a scavenger, um, and they they are only found in saltwater. So we don't have those here, but just showing you the really primitive kinds of fish that do exist. Now, here's a class you probably aren't familiar with: the chondriates. Okay, those are those those sharks and uh, the rays. These are the fish that don't have 
a bony skeleton. Um, they do have jaws and tear fins, so we know that, but they have this skeleton made of cartilage. That's really cool um, because they don't have any bones in their body. Um, and, and these are all from fossil shark teeth, so they're quite common here in Kansas um, because Kansas was a shallow sea. And so we do see some remnants of sharks, although we don't have any freshwater sharks in Kansas. We don't have anything that are here. But that's the, another class of fish. Now we get to the class of fish that we are going to see here in Kansas, the bony, the osteichthys. So what kinds of fish are, are osteichthys? Well, these cool fish, don't find, you won't find these in Kansas, but these are the ancestors of all modern, all of our amphibians and all tetrapods, anything with four legs. So we believe they came from the lobe fin fishes. And so we have um, lung fishes and coelacanths. You've probably heard about them. Maybe every once in a while in Africa, they'll fishermen and some of the lakes in Africa will pull up. The uh, modern lungfin fishes are not, you know, we don't have any here in Kansas, but these lungfin, these lung fishes are actually uh, freshwater and all of these lungfin and lung fishes are freshwater, but not found here. All right. Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Just keep talking loud or stop? Yeah. Really talk to the mic here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now the osteichthys, ray fin fishes. And now we're talking about the kinds of fish that we're familiar with. These are the kinds of fish that are found here in uh, North America. And then they're going to be all of the fish that you're the most familiar with um, here in Kansas. And uh, now some of these lists is like, Trout and not bass and trout and perch, catfish and tuna. And so all of these fish are these ray fin fishes. And these are the, where we get the most numerous of all the vertebrate classes. So about 24,000 different kinds of ray fin fishes. So pretty cool. And they occur everywhere. So where fish occur. So, so that range is anywhere from three miles above sea level to seven miles beneath it. So fish do inhabit every part of the planet. So what are some of the characteristics of the bony fishes? Let's see, there's a picture that didn't come. Oops, let's go back. How do I go back? Wait a minute. Okay, so what are, you, what are your characteristics? Well, you got an endoskeleton made of bone, so you got a skeleton. Let's see. Skeleton, all fish have bones. Oh, yeah. So I mean, I'm sure you've seen skeleton before but so an internal skeleton not that is that thing there so you can see it yeah right closer okay yay yeah an internal skeleton all fish have it they have the skin covered by scales and i've got some examples of some scales over here that um we can look at later they have glands in the skin that secrete a mucus that reduces drag so that's kind of an important point, especially if you're going to be working with people and you might actually be uh, showing people fish that you may sting out. Um, so they, they have this mucus on, fish has a mucus on its body. And that mucus is there for protection and also to, to reduce the drag. Because water is a really thick medium. There's a, um, and so it's hard to move through water. It's the harder to move through water than it is through air. And so fish have that extra coating, but that slimy coating is so important to help it prevent disease transmission. If your hands are wet when you touch a fish, that's the best way because you're, you're going to keep that slime on the fish. If your hands are dry, you pick up a fish, even if you're just out catfishing or fishing with your friends or whatever, if you pick a fish up, you want to make sure you have your hands wet before you touch it because you don't want to pull that slime off of that fish. Um, it's really important. We have you know, every year at the fish hatchery, when we do our spawning, we end up with, you can actually see a handprint on some of the large fish, but they have to be handled 
in order to get the eggs from them. So imagine a 40 pound striped bass that has to be held in order to turn it upside down and, and squeeze the fish out, squeeze the eggs out into your pan. Every year, you know, if, there, if something isn't handled correctly, you'll end up with a fungus print on a pan print on the side of the fish. When you put them back in a couple of days later, where the hand was, you could have a finger and everything on that fish because that fish, and, you know, wasn't necessarily or didn't get handled, you know, the way it needed to be. So the wet, the wet uh, hands will help keep that uh, protection slime coating on the fish. Yeah? Does that go away? It will. I mean, it can. And if and in the case when it's noticed in, a, in the hatchery, for example, they'll treat. Uh, they'll go ahead and, and treat the water with the, uh, to treat that fungus because it's a fungus that grows. But yeah, so it's really important that you handle the fish with with wet hands. And I think, so anyway, a little bit more. I think I have that in here later, but so they possess this lateral line system we'll talk about. They breathe with water across gills. So Fisher, and they have the swim bladder. All of these are things that we're gonna talk a little bit more about. But um, so fins, you know, the fins, everybody knows the fins on a fish, but oh, that's not, we already did that. Oh, I arrow for right so fins these are what they use to move about with right um, some of the fins are paired so you have paired fins which are your pectoral fins and your pelvic fins those are the paired fins in, in these cases and then you have some fins that aren't paired we have the the dorsal fin at the top let's see if, let's see if the let's see if the little it is works so you have paired fins, so you have pelvic fins and you have um, and pectoral fins. This is one side and on the other side is the other pectoral fin. And then those that aren't paired, you have things like the dorsal fin, the caudal fin or the tail fin, and this is called the anal fin. And some fish have all of these, these fins and some don't have all of them. Some of them are reduced, some of them are, are combined with others. So, um, but the placement helps you to figure out where that fish is living. And so we'll talk a little about that there. Okay, so these are, like I said earlier, these are like the arms and legs of the mammal. Um, if they're out to the side, um, like here, they're kind of like worse. If they're really flat along the base, like if you're if your um, pelvic fins stick way out, and uh, that oftentimes means you're a bottom dweller because you're pushed down by the current and, and, the, and you're, you're staying put in the bottom. So, um, so looking at the fins are gonna be a way to help you if you don't know what the fish is. And, and that's one of the ways that you'll have to, if you ever have to key a fish out or run it through a phylogenetic key in order to figure out what it is, um, those are some of the characteristics you'll have to look at, which is, Look at the fins, the number of spines in the fin, whether they're connected or not, whether they have fin, what fin we're going to worry about. But this is a way to help identify fish. So let's see. Fish shapes. What kind of shape? You know, there's a lot to talk about with fish. They're not all the same shape. They're not all the same size and style. Um, so fish shape are the best shape. If you want to be the fastest fish in the ocean or in the water, you're going to have this fusiform shape. So um, this is, remember that, that thickness and stickiness of water is much denser than air. If you want to cut through that, you're going to have this kind of shape. And if you're, so, so what kind of a shape is that? Well, that, here's an example of a tuna. Um, so tuna mackerel sharks. These are the kinds of fish that that have this shape and it's the best shape for you know, going fit fast. It's a torpedo shape. Now, here's a, so depths of water, they have this compressed, they compress from side to side, uh, flat from side to side. So they, they uh, bluegill is a perfect example of this and then Here's the shape that's good for the bottom. It's depressed. That means you're kind of um, flattened on the bottom. And these are the ones that are held by the water current over their back, uh, keeps them down. So the catfish is a good example of that. So those are some other shapes. And then 
This is a cool shape. This is a cigar, a cigar shape. Um, these are oftentimes surface dwellers. So how many times have you seen a gar, you know, hanging out of the top of the water? Yeah. So that's partly, they have this shape because they um, like to hang out near, this, near the surface. And then you've got the fish that look at the currents. So if you're going to be living in the currents, our shape, or it's a little bit like the um, fusiform or the torpedo shape. It's just not quite as torpedo shaped as the earlier one. So walleye is a good example of this. They can slip by. And then you have these fish that have long lip bodies like an eel. Um, and they can wiggle in the crevices and stuff. So those, and then there's even the most extreme case is this guy right here. Not a fish we have in Kansas, but if you want to talk about extreme body shape, I guess I can hold this up to here. Anybody know what this fish is? Yeah, it's a flounder. And so a flounder has this flattened shape that you know, they live on the bottom, and you can see in this uh, picture right here, you know, they, they just disappear in the um, They also have both eyes, on, like a normal fish when they're born. They have an eye on both sides of their body, and they they have fins, and I mean, so when, when they develop, the eye migrates to the top. So the, the second eye migrates to the top of the head. They become this very flattened shape that lives in the bottom like this. So um, really cool fish, very, very extreme uh, body shape. You can take that around. Um, so it's really unique and it's a, it's a truly asymmetrical body shape, something you, you're not gonna see in very many animals. Um, so flounder are in soul, they're in that group. Halibuts are in that group too. They're called flat fishes. Huh? So um, that's kind of cool. Let's see, maybe it'll work. Hey, it worked. No, it went back, okay. Hey, it worked. So the ultimate shape of the is gonna help it stay alive. It's gonna help it to feed and it's gonna help it to move. Um, so those are the things that if I well, let's just quickly look through the different of uh, tails. You know, I said you want to look at the tail. So if you have a that anyway, which kind of fish would have that? Yeah, like a eel. So. Here's an example of a meal. You can see that continuous uh, fin. So this fish doesn't have all the fins we looked at earlier, but it has some, and it's got this one continuous bottle tail. Um, and so this is a fish that's able to give it a sprout, like it is. And so show like this. Is that good? Can you see it? Okay. It's a pretty cool fish. And then uh, there we go. Well, we got two. Who knew? Anyway, we've got uh, fork tails. You'll see that in several different fish species. Those are good for swimming continuously. We've got a lunate tail, which is um, a, a moon, uh, the shape, and that's for good speed if you're going to swim a long time. Um, oh. Well, what did I do now? Okay, there we go. Um, and so and then you've got this kind of trunk is good, but steady, steady and strong. And got another strong and it can be like rounded as well. So different um Hands and tail. So we talked about the uh, <coughs> mucus cover, but most of these fish have a bony scale that like, is covered in a, a scale that looks like normal on a roof. And oh, okay. so, and there are several types of scales, but they're all overlapping. Some fish, though, do lack scale, like a catfish. 
they don't have scales on their body. Um, cowfish are another one that lacks scales, but most fish have that overlapping uh, shingle-like pattern. And, and uh, let's see what. And one of the things that's cool to, to note about scales is that you can count the rings on a scale and you can figure out the age of a fish. And this is actually one of the techniques that a fisheries biologist is going to use in order when he's going to do a, a, a study of a fish population. He needs to know how fast those fish are growing. And he's going to take a measurement of the length and he's going to weigh that fish and he's going to take a scale sample. And then he's in the in winter months when he's not busy, ha ha, I didn't really never any of that. But there would be a time that you could go back, pull out your scale samples, and you're gonna read those scales and, they, and the fish grows in rings, okay? The scale growth is in, in a ring pattern and you can count those rings and you can age, you know, you can see the, it doesn't, you can kind of see those rings here and you can count those rings and you can get an age assessment. So if you know how big your fish is and you know how old it is, then you can know how fast it's growing. And uh, so he's gonna do that with a lot. They're gonna, the fisheries biologist is gonna do that with his whole sample. And then he's gonna get a good idea of what is, what the fish population is like. So, so those rings are, those, those are annual. So each yes. one represents one full year. Well, no, there's some, you can, there's a like, ring that represents the growth of the year, and then you have some lighter rings. But yes, you can tell. Um, so I have to show you um, the age on this one. Yeah, I can. Um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's basically the darker ring. You want to look at the darker rings, and that's going to be the end of the year. So yes, it's going to grow. Uh, one ring is going to more or less use one year. That one's a really old fish, actually. That example. Um, okay. All right. So, um, as we said, the mucus helps to make fish. And uh, the, the color itself is uh, it's interesting that the fish there helps treat it uh, next to the fish. And even in a freshwater fish, there's going to be salt content in the water and in the fish. Uh, we, you know, one of the ways to prevent, uh, one of the tricks, I guess, to help fish um, deal with stress, so when you haul fish in or you're hauling fish out or you're going to move them around or you have some sort of infection, and you're going to salt them. We salt the racers, salt the racers down. And that salt helps them um, boost their mucus, you know, their protection against disease. So, yeah, that's kind of good. Cool. Um, uh, I just can't get this. I just need to. Okay. <laughs> so, this is where I said earlier wet your hands before you handle a fish. You always want to wet your hands before you handle a fish. And that's because you want to keep that. On the fish. Ah, jaws. So, not all fish have teeth, but they may be present. And when these teeth are present, they may be in places not where you're expecting them. They may be on the roof of the mouth. They may be on the tongue. Um, they actually may even be in the throat. Um, so, some fish, and this is what actually one of the, we'll get to this in a little while, but helps you to characterize these fish as a minnow is the fact that they have um, pharyngeal teeth. So these are fish that are teeth that are actually in the throat. And I think it's not here. Um, I don't know. I wish it looking. Uh, these are from a big carp, but uh, these teeth are actually in the, in the throat of the of the fish. So, so um, they're sort of behind the gills and they help tear and crush the food up. Um, but this is a characteristic of a class of fish, not, you know, of a, of a family of fish rather. And it doesn't, uh, so we'll talk about this later, but minnows, people think minnows are small fish. Not minnows can get big. 
It's just that they have certain characteristics, and one of those characteristics is it's very little heat. And uh, some fish, it's kind of interesting that some of the uh, big fish uh, are filter feeders, like a paddlefish, one of our fish. They eat some of the smallest things, and they, they um, like hair like structures that uh, are in their, around their gills. Um, that helps to string up these. So they're filter feeders. Okay, they're in that box. See if that. So the mouth is important. So what kinds of mouths? There's lots of different kinds of mouth. My mouth. <laughs> um, so if you have a large mouth, like hence large mouth bass, you're going to be able to suck in a lot of fish and, uh, and take a big bite. If you have I love it. Let's go back one. Let's go back to here. Okay. So if you have a small mouth, you're probably going to nibble on stuff, plants and small animals. If you have a dorsal mouth, now this is a, a full mouth. This is uh, for eating near the surface. And there's even some extreme examples of that. And then you have an inferior mouth. It's good for you know, you can make the assumption that this guy eats on the bottom because his mouth is on the bottom. Um, so yeah, just different kinds of mouths. All right. A fish has everything that we have, all the organs that we have for the most part. Um, we're all familiar with heads and stomachs and hearts and intestines and liver and spleen. Well, what do fish have that we don't have? Let's see. Um, oh, here's an inch. Yeah. If you want to figure out the sex of a fish, you're probably not going to be very successful in that because most of the time there aren't external differences. There are in some fish, but uh, the males and females, you know, look the same. And uh, you're only going to probably find that out if you, you know, were to clean the fish or you were looking internally at the gonad. So most fish, you can't look at them and just tell the sex of them. Um, so here, these are kind of, these are two kind of cool facts. So, most fish are carnivorous. other fish, and if you are a carnivorous fish, you're going to have a short gut with a silvery lining. You might think, why do I need to know that? But that is actually one of the characteristics in a key. If you had to key a fish out, you might actually have to look at the gut. You might have to see whether it's silver and short, or what would be the other possibility? It would be long and have a black line. There are a few fish that are herbivores, so they do eat just plants, not very many. But in order to digest plants, as we see in lots of other animals, it takes it's a long process to digest plant material. And you need it to be a little bit hotter, and so the black lining of the intestine helps to do that, helps to provide that heat. And it, can, it has to be a longer intestine to get it get through that whole process. So there are some keys. That's a characteristic you have to, you know, so it means sacrificing the fish. And I'm able to figure out just what kind of fish it is without having a specimen that you can, you can dissect. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind, of, kind of a cool fact. Let's see. Let's go. And here's something that fish have that no other animal does have. And it's not seen in other vertebrates, let's put it that way. And that is an air bladder. So um, it's an outgrowth of the intestinal tract, and it's only found in the ray fin fishes. Go so back to these bony fishes that we have that are common here. Um, and they function like lungs in some fish, so like gar. Um, they can be out of the water for about up to an hour and still survive because they can actually process oxygen through their air bladder. And um, there are some fish that help it produce sounds like in the drum. So one more. And so why do you need an air bladder? Well, if you wanna stay in the water column, you've got to have the ability to control your buoyancy. And so your density. So fish need this air bladder to help them with their density. Um, not every fish has an air bladder. There is a group of fish that in Kansas that don't have them, 
and that is the darters we'll talk about those earlier or later but then that people kind of know about sharks that they have to swim all the time everybody else says well if the sharks sharks stop swimming then uh, they die because they float to the, they sink to the bottom and there is some truth to that um because they remember they're not a bony fin fish they belong to those cartilaginous fish and they don't have an air bladder but what help with the trick they have besides having an air bladder they i mean they don't have an air bladder but what compensates in the shark is they have that really fatty oil in their liver and that's an oil that's why everybody knows about shark liver oil and it's been used for years and years as a tonic and a uh, preventative and stuff but sharks have this ama- immensely huge liver to help them be more buoyant because they don't have an air bladder and they can't control their buoyancy. Did you have a question? Well, no. Okay. So I was wondering, I was wondering, so, so filling the air bladder is a metabolic process because they don't actually go to the surface to get air. They actually... Yeah. Because uh, they can go to, it's, like, it's like a buoyancy vest. I mean, you have to add and subtract air to it in order to maintain buoyancy. Right. It's actually a process that moves the air in and out of the bladder. Um, well, yeah, it's in the intestine. Yeah, right. So it's in the intestine. So, yes, that's a great question as far as how does the fish actually control its air bladder, the input into it. I've got to so look it up. Yeah, it would be, it's not a, necessarily a conscious thing that, but they're going to, to be able to control it. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. We got to look up how the fish get air in their air bladder. Yeah. So yeah, good question. So what sense do fish possess? Well, they possess all of the major senses that we have. And I'll give you a, a, a tip here. Um, sound travels faster and better and farther in water than it does through air. It remembers different mediums completely. And sound goes through the, the, the water faster. And that's a big tip. If you come to the Milford Fish Hatchery and you want to see a fish, be quiet. And how many times have you been told, be quiet, you're going to scare the fish away when you go out fishing with your friends or whatever. Uh, you're with your grandpa, you say, hey, you be quiet. Fish should get, because the sound carries farther and faster in the water. And fish hear it. Fish have good hearing. And so they hear that sound, they're going to go down to the bottom. They're going to get out of sight. Um, so, you uh, need to be you know, quiet around when you go fishing because sound travels better in water than it does through air. Fish do have a sense of smell and uh, they can, there's evidence that some fish recognize their home territories by the, by the smell. Um, they detect odors. They have nares or holes in the front of their face in the place you would expect to see a nose. Um, and they do have taste. Taste is pretty important to a fish. Um, and some fish use their sense of taste to locate food rather than using um, a sense of you know, their eyesight. So, for example, here's a good example of catfish. They're a pretty common fish here, you know, probably the most popular fish in Kansas. My catfish is missing his whisker, okay, his barbels. But barbels are actually covered in taste buds. So, a catfish does so well in murky water because he doesn't need to see his fish at all. He doesn't need to see the food. He can actually taste it before it gets into his mouth. So if you live in water, the reason you have taste buds in your mouth is because it's a moist environment. Your taste buds need moisture to work. If you live in the water, you don't have to have your taste buds in your mouth. If you live in water and you're not going to dry out, you can have your taste buds here or here or there. Um, but this catfish, for example, has all of its taste buds concentrated on those barbels that would be hanging down here. I know this is going to be hard to see, but catfish, you know, have those whiskers that give them the name catfish, and those are covered in bar in, in taste buds. So a catfish can taste its food before it actually gets in its mouth. And other fish have taste buds elsewhere than in their mouth. So we have to stop thinking like a human and kind of think like a fish. If you live in water, you don't have to have your taste buds in your mouth. You can have them concentrated on your head. You can have them concentrated elsewhere. Uh huh. What's the difference for fish between smelling something and tasting something? Well, even in a mammal, even in humans, that's a, a 
pretty finite, it's a pretty subtle difference. We, it's a chemical detection and we're, uh, our taste and our sense of smell is wrapped up together. You, you know, if you have a cold and you can't smell something, who doesn't taste this good either? And so, but as far as it is, you know, odors, there are, um, it is a, is a, is a it is a very subtle difference between taste and smell. Um, or is it just like the, the sensory structure itself is quite a different? Well, yeah, taste buds have, yeah, the ability to um, you, yes, I mean, the uh, taste buds are gonna be focused on, they're both chemical sensors, so, I think we can kind of put them in these categories to make it easier for us to uh, understand them a little better. But in essence, they're both chemical receptors, and you're you're recepting whether it's a smell. Those are you know when you smell something, there's particles of, of whatever. Say you're boiling spaghetti sauce, when you walk in the room, you can smell that because there are particles of that spaghetti sauce floating through the air. You can also taste those particles when you put them in your mouth. Um, so it's really kind of the same. I have the same sense, but yeah, we do talk about them as smell and taste being two separate things. Um, great question. And then sight, like I said, fish, fish because of the optical quality. There's not a lot of light penetration in the water column. I mean, as you go further down, light, the amount of light that reaches the bottom disappears significantly. So there's a zone in the top of the water where there's a lot of light. But uh, so fish are able to see some fish like a walleye. They have a crystalline substance in their eye that lets them see in small amounts of light. Um, some fish are, a walleye is another example of a fish that's a sight feeder. He has to see his food to catch it. Uh, bass is one of those two. He has to see his food to catch it. They rely on their eyesight more than their sense of taste or sense of smell to find their food. Um, so they are using their eyesight. So sight is in, is important to fish, and uh, we and most of our fish are pretty good. Oh well, we'll just go with it. So touch, fish do possess, possess you know, a sense of touch, but they have. Line system, which is called the distant touch. And um, it's all along the lateral line is a series of tubular canals along the side of the fish. And they detect differences in um, pressure on the fish. And so they can, so it's been called, um, so motion causes vibrations in the water at low frequencies. And it causes pressures on different parts of the fish. And they can, they can detect that through that lateral line. So they do have this sense that we really don't have a comparison to. Um, and then some fish do have the ability to detect electricity and help them to find prey in muddy waters or, or help them to navigate. We don't have, um, we don't see that Kansas much. So reproduction, yeah, it's as varied as there are kinds of fishes. But I will say that most fish are single sex. They're either male or they're female. And most fish use Fertilization. So, uh, generalization. Remember, there's forty thousand different kinds of fish. You know, it's a it's a pretty. But and most fish have this strategy where they're going to broadcast a lot of eggs. They're not going to provide a lot of parental care, and they're going to put out a lot of eggs in order for one to survive to replace them. In the strategy of things, when we look at the way we do things, you know, humans spend a lot of time taking care of our offspring. We spend 18 years, 20 years, 30 years, how the rest of our lives taking care of our, our children um, so that they grow up to be successful and, and uh, thrive. A lot of other animals have a different strategy. They, they make millions and millions of eggs. There are 20 to 40,000 eggs per pound produced by a walleye. And so a five pound female is gonna have 20, 200,000 eggs. So only one of those needs to survive to replace her in the scheme of things. So they're, they're gonna put out a lot of eggs. There's not gonna be much parental care. Well, there's almost zero, but there are fish. There are exceptions, of course. There are fish that are mouth breeders. There are fish that guard their eggs, like a, like a bluegill. So there are different strategies, but I'm just saying in general, fish are gonna produce a lot of eggs 
and not provide a lot of time and energy into caring for those eggs. And then those young, when they hatch, they're called fry. Um, and they're tiny, they're very thin, they're microscopic in a lot of places, they're not microscopic, but they're, they're tiny. And uh, so they're gonna, a lot of them are gonna get eaten. And so, but you just need a few in order to serve one to float, uh, to pass you. And then fish as consumers, yeah. Let me just, oh. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go back. Well, how did I go to? Wow. Sorry, I really apologize for that. I just got, we went a long way. All right. So anyway, as we said earlier, fish are, you know, some are herbivores, some are carnivores. Most of them, you know, are a little bit of both on the boards. And then some are parasitic, which we looked at like the, the uh, chestnut lamprey. Some of the largest fish eat the smallest food. That it, isn't that blow your mind in both the ocean and in the, and in the um, freshwater system? And in our case in Kansas, the paddlefish is that big fish can grow to 100 pounds, but they eat microscopic plankton and zooplankton. And then... Some fish can eat larger fish by dislocating their jaws and sucking them in. We'll talk, that's like our largemouth bass. But here's a fish, there's a, I, the picture showed up before this came up. But anyway, there is a, this is a, this is not a can. They can use a jet of water to dislodge insects from leaves on vegetation outside the stream that causes the, the uh, um, bug to fall down into the water and that's how they eat them. So, so very extreme case of eating your food through a unique way. And then, so I think with this, kind of just gonna quickly go through, yeah, just gonna quickly go through what we do have here in Kansas. So lampreys. Um, so remember those jawless fishes and uh, the mouth is that sucking disc. These are the fish that we think are extirpated in Kansas. They would have been found in the Missouri and Kansas rivers, but at this point in time, um, with all the changes, they need a large river. These are not, we haven't been able to find these here in Kansas. Uh, for many years. Now, we have sturgeon. This is a fish that oftentimes people think of it as a kind of reminds them of a shark um, because they have this really tall uh, part on their caudal fin, their upper tail fin. It kind of sticks out of the water and gives you the appearance of a, of a shark. Um, so this is an important fish because for humans, we, we are involved with this fish because the eggs of sturgeon are caviar. If you aren't familiar with caviar, um, so in other places, and even here in Kansas, um, sturgeon have been harvested just for the eggs. And uh, that is a, this process of harvesting sturgeon for the eggs is usually a lethal process. Um, and if the eggs are not quite ripe, the eggs are green. Um, and uh, that is what causes the predated on or, or killed prematurely, you see the broad sandy channel. So again, you need big rivers like Missouri, the Kansas and the Republican River. Um, it's not well known how many sturgeon there are in, in Kansas right now. Um, so that, that question exists, but uh, there are still some sturgeon here in Kansas. And they're a cool fish if you ever, they're very prehistoric looking. Um, they're a fish that, and then right along next to them is the paddlefish. So another really prehistoric looking fish. It's probably one of the most unusual fish we have here in Kansas. Um, has this long paddle-like snout. Uh, and people are still kind of making guesses as to what that is for. There's one school of thought that this, so this fish, is that large fish that eats very straining out the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, eating these microscopic organisms. So 
there's a thought that because it swims with its mouth open, this picture doesn't have that, that this paddle helps to counterbalance it. There is some belief that there are some sensors on the snout um, and uh, that that's part of it too. So it, it's still not 100% sure why they have such a large nose or a large snout. Um, but they live in large rivers and lakes and they migrate upstream to spawn. So they have no internal bones, but they do have uh, some bone in the head, but they don't have the, the body as part of the um, which makes them a popular fish. This is the kind of fish that you're only gonna catch if you're snagged. So in Kansas, if the regulation, there are a couple of rivers in Kansas, these guys are gonna make their spawning upstream. Um, and then that is where you're gonna have an opportunity to catch them. It's limited seasons on, it's a couple of weeks when they make the spawning run. They're not gonna take a hook because what are you gonna bait it with? I mean, they are five or five and they eat pints. And so they're snagged. And so that's a large hook that's thrown out in the water and you reel it in and you catch stuff on the, catch it on the side. Um, here in Kansas, there's a place in Chautauqua down in Southeast Kansas where you can catch them for like a couple of, of weeks snagging season. You know, they grow. We, we have find them in Milford Lake even uh, on occasion, um, but nobody catches them because you're not, you can't catch them with a, a hook. So, um, but in, in Milford for a number of years, we did a program where we had, we were hatching paddlefish eggs. It's a, it's a cool program and they might still be um, to work with this a little more, you raise fish and stock them in Oklahoma because the number they make spawning runs. And so the only way to catch them is on their spawning room. And that spawning run is going to bring them up into Kansas. So we were in a cooperative program. And it was actually through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was a program to help reintroduce paddlefish. It's cool to have the paddlefish because even as little guys, they have just a little bit of a snout. And so they're in there and they stay to the top of the water. The cool thing is they're, they're, they're easy to see. And so in the raceways there at the hatchery, we could see the paddlefish because they were all up at the top. Um, I kept them in an aquarium for a, a number of years. And one of two things about that, um, you don't want to put a fish with a long snout like this in a big square <laughs> aquarium, right? Because they get, fish have a lousy reverse. All right, they don't back up very well. That's why they get caught in traps and nets and things because they don't how to get out. Swimming and and so um, do you need a round tank for it? Because if they get in a corner tank, they just kind of bounce and bounce and bounce and their nose gets bumped up and stuff. So you put them in a round tank and they can just swim around and around and around. <laughs> Um, the other thing about keeping them in an aquarium is the water, the food that, you know, even the particles that we fed them um, are in the top of the water column. Because once it gets down to the bottom, once it floats through where they feed, it just goes to the bottom and it's unavailable. So you got to feed them a couple of times a day to make sure they're eating the food because they're only going to feed in that zone right at the top of the aquarium. And once it gets down to the bottom, they don't go down. So, so what do you feed a plankton feeder? Well, there's some... There's some really tiny uh, pellet. It's a it's a powder food almost that you can get them to take, and that's part of what the hatchery was doing is training them to eat. Because um, you can train them to eat a, a pellet food or a very fine brown food, but um, but that's not what they would eat in, in nature, you know. But you can get nutrition in them through a, a pelleted kind of. So once they're released in nature, do they adapt? And find yes, them? they do. Once they once they're back in nature, they, they revert to their normal feeding. So, all right, let's go to the next one. So paddlefish, one of my favorite fish, cool fish. Gar, now we have lots of gar in Kansas, and these are the ones that are easy to recognize. They have a mouthful of teeth, and they're this long cigar shape. And notice they don't have a dorsal fin at all. Um, so they've got um, just a, they also have a different kind of scale on their body. If you want to look at this one later, they have, so there's two kinds of scale. Yeah, 
and that's very true. I don't know how many people have been there and read the book. I actually think they're pretty good. Um, they grow big. You can get get pretty good sized gar. It, it literally takes an axe to clean them because you've got to get through those ganoid scales. Um, but uh, I think they have. A, I think they actually taste pretty good. But then when you're in college and you're young and you don't have any money, then you eat things like gar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Anyway. Um, but uh, gar are a fish that uh, a lot of teeth. Um, part of the, when you're trying to figure out which kind of gar that we have, um, we have spotted gar, long nosed gar, short nosed gar, well, it's long nose, but short nose, well, it's, you know, how long is this versus, uh, you know, the distance between the eye and the fin, and, you know, there's, there's lots of things to look at. But so gar are a uh, pretty cool fish. And another thing, gar have the only toxic part in the fish in Kansas. Gar eggs are poisonous, okay? Um, to eat. So, so that's the only fish in Kansas that has anything, um, any toxic parts to them. But like I said, when we set, talked about the air bladder, these fish can survive out of water for about an hour using that air bladder as a, as a lung. Um, and one of the things I will say, I, I get disappointed. People think that the gar is a trash fish or they want to get rid of it and they just throw it on the bank. You know, that fish is going to live for an hour out there uh, struggling to breathe. And, and, uh, I would really like to see people not do that. It's a personal thing. Um, okay. Gold eye. This is probably a family that you don't see very much. Um, we do get them in large rivers. They have this reflective layer of tissue on their eye, which gives them an eye shine. Hence, that's why we call them a gold eye. But um, this is a species that is stable in Milford Lake. So if you come to Milford Lake and go fishing, you may catch these gold eyes. Um, otherwise, they're really not very, you know, very common in, in Kansas. But we do have this population in, in Milford Lake. They're, a, they're basically a forage fish. You know, they're, they're going to su support some of the bigger predators in the lake. Um, an eel, cool fish. Uh, I showed that example earlier. So eels are a fish that is called, it's a catadromous means that there are eels in salt water they actually migrate to fresh water, kind of opposite of other fish you might be aware of, like, um, you know, uh, salmon, who do just the opposite. They are born in, uh, you know, they're, they live their life in salt water and come to fresh water to spawn. But, so the eel is just the opposite, okay, opposite. They're not born in fresh water. So they come to Kansas. When they're here, they're 3,000 miles away from where they were born. And they actually are, most American eels are born in the Sargasso Sea, which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, so we actually found one of these eels when they, uh, at Milford Lake. So you find them in the rivers and stuff, but they're amazing about getting into the cracks and stuff. So in the, when, Every 10 years, the dental plays infected. So they do this whole dewatering thing. There's a, there's a kettle up where the water is coming out of the dam. There's a big kettle there. It's, very, it's a lot deeper than you think it is. And so they have to dry that. They block off the river. They dry it up. But they pump out all the water. And then they walk through these big tubes in order to go in and inspect the dam. Well, one of those dewaterings one time, we found an eel. And it's up in a little side cavity uh, along the side of the of the. Um, lakes and we grabbed it. We put it in an aquarium and oh, this is so cool. We're going to put this fish in an aquarium. It's going to be great. This eel, it's about this long, you know, slimiest thing you've ever seen. And you talk about slippery, man, you couldn't hold on to that for anything. Put it in this big 125 gallon tank. But, ah, cool. What? All day long, we hid. Couldn't see him. Had no idea he was in there every night. It was a heyday. 
he uprooted all the plants. We see this muddy mess in the morning. And then at the end of the day, it settled, and the filter would take over and work, and the eel would be nowhere to be seen. The next day, whoosh, come in the next morning, the aquarium was just a total mess. So we let him go. <laughs> we took him back, but we let him go. He was like, this isn't working out. Um, but uh, it was cool. It was the coolest. It was cool. It was the first deal I'd ever really gotten my hands on and actually got to, to touch and hold. Um, but so we did get them. We did see them in Kansas, but not very often. And what's cool about them is they don't, they're not born in Kansas. So herring, we have a, you, herring you hear of as a, as a saltwater fish species, but we do have some freshwater members. And, and the gizzard chat is the one that we're the most familiar with. And they're big and fish. Um, you see them throughout the state. But they are actually a member of the herring family. So they're a type of herring. Yeah. Yeah. If they're born in the Atlantic Ocean, how long would it take to migrate to Kansas? Yeah, I, it can take a while. <laughs> and, and if you don't have, and they're coming through the Gulf, of course, the only way here is up through the Mississippi River. And if, you, if there's any changes in the Mississippi, which there are, and there's lots of barriers in there, it, it's harder and harder to, for them to get here. But yeah, literally, it can take years for them to get here. Um, I don't know of any tagging studies or anything that's been done. So it's, it'd be a cool Cool thing to <laughs> food, I guess, and and, and availability, a place to. Uh, they, go back to the they do. It doesn't seem like it's worth it coming all the way to Kansas, <laughs> but you know we get snowy owls every year too. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, then you don't see a lot of them. I, I will say in my years at the nature center that one at milford lake was the only one i've ever seen it's the only one i've ever had my a chance to see so i don't know how many there are in the state but we do on occasion you know get them and, and you see them so now minnows here's that family everybody calls anything that's little a minnow but minnows are anything but little um they may be little fish but they also may be big fish so fish like um, carp are minnows, goldfish are minnows. They all belong to the same family. So what makes you a minnow? Well, a minnow has certain characteristics. And the they are they have these teeth behind their gills, they lack scales on their head, they can have a lateral line, and they have a short triangular or squared dorsal angle then that lack bone spines. Whoosh. Okay. But anyway, the point is, they're not all little. So a minnow, um, and it's the largest family we have in Kansas. So there are more than a third of all the different fish species in Kansas are actually minnows. They all belong to the minnow family. Um, so just being a, just because it's a small fish doesn't make it a minnow. This, that's probably my point is just know that to be a minnow, you actually have certain characteristics and one of them is those pharyngeal teeth in your back and your throat teeth. But there are a couple other things too. But we have lots of, you know, stone rollers, grass carp, chart, uh, chubs, uh, shiners. These are all different types of, of minnows. And if you look at that book, The Stream Fish, gave you Kansas hair. So let's move on. Suckers are another type of fish you find here in Kansas. Um, they have mouths that are located permanently on the bottom. They are they are designed for sucking up material. I think of them as little vacuum things. So suckers in my mind are little vacuum things that go on the bottom and suck up the rock and spit out the rocks and get all the good stuff off. They have these little little teeth on their in their mouth that help scrape scrape the rocks. Um, but they can get pretty big. So a big mouth buffalo can get over eighty pounds. Um, so they're 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 kind of a, a cool group of fish. And then catfish. These are fish that you're probably really familiar with, but I bet there are, there are 12 kinds of catfish in Kansas, but I bet six of them you've never heard of um, because they're small and tiny and they live in streams. And these are all of the mad 
toms and plus the stone cat. So bad toms are a tiny catfish that don't get very large, you know, six inches, eight inches. I think the stone cat probably gets the biggest of all the of all the smaller catfish. And uh, they, you'll never see them uh, unless you go staining in a stream and, and saying some up. Um, but as I said earlier, the, the barbels of the catfish are covered in taste buds. And so they actually can taste the food before it gets to their mouth. They can live in very murky water conditions because they don't use their eyesight. They use their sense of taste and their sense of smell, which is kind of wrapped up together and uh, to find their food. Now, the other thing about a catfish that you want to know about are their spines. The catfish has, has some spines. They have a pectoral spine and they have this dorsal fin spine right here. There's a dorsal fin spine and a pectoral fin spine. Uh, closer. Like there, there's a pectoral fin and dorsal fin. What this means is this spine is actually topped with a, a mild toxin or a mild poison. So if you grab a catfish wrong, you're gonna get you're gonna get poked by the spine. And some pe and some people it causes a little bit of a reaction. It certainly makes you go yow and it makes it sting and it and it might uh, stay or that little feeling might stay around for a while. Um, but that, but it's important to note about that. Remember, catfish don't have any scales. How are you going to age a catfish? Guess what? The spines grow rings. So you can cut the spine and you can make a thin little section of spine and you can count them into that. So you can figure out how the catfish is that way. Um, and you can actually take the, the, the spine off of the pectoral fin without hurting the fish or it hurts it, but it doesn't kill it and it doesn't yank the fin off the flesh. Almost like a little, you kind of push in and, put, and twist and you can pull that spine out. Of course, you do have to rip it along the thin edge, but you can actually dislodge that, that spine. And then, so that's what a fishery biologist is going to do. If you're going to have to do age, age on catfish, it's going to take a sample of the dorsal spine, um, so or excuse me, the pectoral spine. Um, it back, yeah. it, no, that spine doesn't grow back. It's like, but here's here you can kind of see it's a small one, but you can kind of see that little end on it where you can kind of pull it out in this right here. I can have Andrew show that. Uh, it's too small to really show on the camera. I'm sorry, it's just tiny. Um, but so, so yeah, when you're handling catfish, if you are staining catfish shepherds, whatever you want to be careful. If you if you you want to have one, you know, I, I talk. I keep talking about making sure your hands are wet. One of the best ways to handle fish, period, is have wet gloves on, um, and that way you're not pulling your slime off, and you're not you're protecting yourself from being poked by a spine. On, it, on catfish or something like that. But catfish have, have those spines on and they will, as soon as you stain them up or get them out of the water, they all, all those spines go right out. The dorsal spine goes way up. Um, they get caught in the nets. It's fun. Here's a funny story. So we we also have rehab pelicans in the past and uh, pelicans are fishing birds, of course. And so we have a catfish hatchery right next door to us and we have some catfish available to us that might be dead already or something. And so, but they die with their fins out like this. So you give them to the pelican, the pelican's trying to swallow catfish by the like, like this. And the poor pelican gets the fish down because, and they don't like catfish generally. They kind of like, I don't really want that because of the spines on their on their body. But yeah, so be aware of the spines if you're, if you're handling cattle catfish or any catfish. Um, they all have them, but uh, so that's, so you're probably familiar with, you know, we have channel cats, most popular fish probably in Kansas because they live in farm ponds and murky waters as well as in big reservoirs and they can be found in streams. Flatheads are another popular fish. Blue cats are something we see, we have quite a few blue cats at Milford, so they're another large catfish. Um, yellow bullhead, black bullhead, and brown bullhead are all smaller catfish, um, kind of pretty common in like a farm pond situation. A lot of times people have those. And then all these mad toms are really tiny. All right. And they're stream fish. 
couple other fish. We have pike. We have here in Canada. And they help stabilize. Um, so the walleye is, is, is not, a, it's a perch actually. And so it's kind of confusing. You won't see very many pike in Kansas. Trout, another family of fish that we don't have any self sustaining trout populations in Kansas. Our water is too, gets too warm in Kansas. So when the trout fisheries that we do have in the state are all wintertime fishery opportunities. They're put in in the winter when the water has great oxygen levels, it's really cold. The fish can survive, but if they're not caught before we get to April or May, those fish are probably going to die if they're not caught out. So it's a put and take fishery that happens in the winter time. It's a winter opportunity. There's a few places in Kansas that have cold enough fed stream. Spring they have out there uh, where the the spring comes out of the ground. There's a pool there, and they keep trout there year round because they have that cold water. And that, it, but it's just a small little pool that they can keep trout in. So, but if you were to put trout in Moon Lake on Fort Riley, that's only going to happen in the winter time. It's only for a limited amount of time because trout need cold water and lots of oxygen. And we just don't have the right kind. Um, we do also sometimes trade fish with Colorado for trout. So in Kansas, for example, we produce a lot of channel catfish and Colorado doesn't. They, on the other hand, produce a lot of trout. So the hatcheries actually get together and trade fish sometimes. We might trade our catfish for some of their trout or something like that. So there is some trading that goes along. Codfishes, you are probably never going to see one in Kansas, but there is one. Freshwater cod is called a derbit, and you need to find it only in the northeast part of the state. So I've never seen one in Kansas, um, but it is kind of a cool fish. And then we got a couple of smaller, lesser known fish species, you know, top minnows, like their name says, they have a, a mouth that is good for just getting things off of the top of the water. Um, so these are mostly, I see these mostly in the western part of the state. If you're out in around the Pratt area and then that county, uh, Pratt County and places like that. There's some top minnows in those sandy bottom streams out there. I don't see too many top minnows around here. Mosquito fish though, on the other hand, we have around here. Mosquito fish are kind of cool, but they are an introduced fish. They weren't normal for, they weren't found here originally, but they are actually a guppy. You know, everybody knows about guppies, which you can buy at the pet store. And guppies give live birth, all right? They give really big and the, and the uh, younger, you know, come out of the eggs in their body and let them develop and then the fish emerge. They look like they're uh, having live fish. But anyway, um, they eat mosquito larvae. So that's why they were brought in. And that's why they were originally stocked in Kansas was to, to eat mosquito larvae, which they do do. Um, there really hasn't, I would say of all the, you know, introductions can give us a lot of problems when we try to, try to play God, you know, with, with nature. And oftentimes things happen that we're not anticipating. But with mosquito fish, they haven't really been a, you know, a terrible introduction. They do eat mosquito larvae, but and they don't kind of overpower. And, um, silver sides, this is a, a freshwater species that it's called the brook silver sides. Most of their family is marine. You wouldn't find too many other silver sides. Uh, they would mostly be found in the ocean. I will say that if you say up silver sides, when you look at them wrong, they die. So, um, sculpins, though, are cool fish that we find in the Ozarkian stream, so in the southeast port part of the state. Um, they um, have these kind of big head and a short, stumpy body. Um, they just the cool fish. They remind you of the some saltwater fish that you see. Gobies, anybody know what a goby is? You've seen the gobies in the ocean. They're kind of like that. So we have sculpins here in Kansas. And we're going to finish up. Okay, a couple of others are... So this fish species, the um, bass fish, okay, we're going to talk about these big guys here. So you probably heard about striped bass and white bass. So these are popular fish, they're sport fish. Um, 
This is a striped bass. They're, this family of fish is mostly a marine family. And striped bass live in freshwater and salt waters. So you can go fishing for striped bass. You go down to, to Georgia, you go off to the coast of Florida or whatever, you can fish for striped bass. They grow bigger in the ocean because it's warmer and there's more food available, but they grow pretty good in Kansas as well. So our largest, the record striped bass in Kansas is, is around 45, 48 pounds or around 50 pounds is the largest one. So that's a pretty good sized fish. People are pretty happy if they catch that. Striped bass grow big, but they're not a very much of a fighter. You catch them, you get them, and they tug on your line, and then you pull them in the boat, and you're like, oh, wow, that's a big fish. Now, there's a cousin of this fish. Um, so this is a striped bass with its name from the stripe pattern on the side. All right. So there's another fish called the white bass. Doesn't get as big. Looks very similar. Um, it's a great fish to catch if you want to get some play on your line. They, they, get, they make a run. They're in school. Once you get into a school white bass, boy, you're and catch them one after another and bring them in. So you get a lot of fight from them and a lot of fun to catch, but they don't get very big. So what do you think would happen if you took a white bass and crossed it with a striped bass? Which is what we do at Milford, by the way. Milford Fish Hatchery is one of the hatcheries in Kansas. And this is one of our main fish that we produce at Milford. It was a hybrid fish produced between the striped bass and the white bass. Do they know what it's called? A white bass. Yeah, it also has other names like palmetto bass or sunshine bass, and other names for for um, the wiper. But so the idea is you get a big fish with a lot of play, with a lot of bite. So it makes it a popular fish for. But it's a hatchery produced fish. These two fish don't get together in the fish. And produce on their own. So if you catch a wiper in Kansas, you're catching a hatchery produced fish, fish that hatch is hatched in the hatchery. And so um, there you'll see posters like this that help you to identify um, there are tooth patches on the fish. And so that's one of the, you know, when you look at these, these two fish look very similar, don't they? Um, so how it just one of the things you see sometimes, let me grab my pointer, is that um you see the stripes are a little bit broken up on the side of this one. Uh, and then of course on the white bass, they're not as complete either. And so when you catch this fish, what do you have? Do you have a white bass or do you have a wiper? So you have to look at the tooth patches on the tongue. And so the wiper has two tooth patches. The striper has two tooth patches, but the white bass has one. These posters are are all about helping you to identify um, amongst those different kinds. So you have to look at that tooth patch that's on the tongue to help you tell if it's a white bass or a wiper. Um, and the size, you know, obviously the size, um, the wiper gets bigger, it gets comparable to large white bass. Um, so that's, but uh, we have a, quite a few. So at Milford, we're one of the few, we are the hatchery that produces the strike, the um, the wipers. We have striped bass broodstock at the hatchery. So if you ever come and visit us, you will see the striped bass broodstock outside in the raceways. Right now, we have uh, our largest broodstock. They're about 40 pounds. And uh, we have a couple other year classes that are younger than that. But they're all up there, 25 to 40 pounds females that we get the eggs from. And then the white bass sperm is used to create the typical cross. But there are different ways of doing it. Hybrid, you could take white bass. The difference between the palmetto bass and the shunshine bass. It depends on which egg you use and which sperm you use. That's kind of the difference there. All right, we need to get on. Yeah, yeah. Are wipers sterile the same as rolls are sterile? In theory, yes, but all sterile fit. Even a mule is not 100% sterile. Um, there are There is some ability to reproduce, but it doesn't happen in in the natural settings for the most part, yeah. But you couldn't say with 100% certainty that there is no way they could reproduce, but it, it just doesn't happen. Um, They're at least not good enough reproducers to get a 
Correct, correct. They have to continue to be produced in the hatchery. Yes, right, right. And we need to look at our definition of, of uh, species when it comes to fish. You know, we have this definition of species and not being able to interbreed and blah, blah, blah. But uh, fish sometimes break the rules. Um, and then a lot, so sun, sunfishes, here's the fish family that we're all the most familiar with probably if you're a Kansan and you've been fishing in Kansas, you know about this family. It's a big family, or it's got 12 members, but it's got all the ones that we know. It's got the basses. Okay, so before I talked about striped bass, white bass, and wipers, those are a sea bass family. But what you think of as a bass, if I said, what's a bass that lives in Kansas? I bet you're going to say large bass. bass or smallmouth bass, or spotted bass, or something like that. So those are actually sunfishes. So we have, and those go by a term of black basses. So largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, a spotted bass, those are black basses. Um, and then you got crappies, or some people say crappies. <laughs> Then we have what we call the pan fishes, because they about fit in your pan. So you lay this fish out, and he's going to be just right to fit in your pan. That's why it's called a pan fish. And so those are your sunfishes like your bluegill, and your orange spotted, and your red ear, and your green sunfish. Those sunfishes are uh, what we call a pan fish. So um, they are active in the daytime. And they are actually sight feeders. So they need to find their food by using their good eyesight. And these actually, some of these, the sunfishes actually do provide some nest care. The male, actually the male sunfishes guard the nest and uh, protect the eggs while they're hatching. You know, but after that, they don't provide much. They do actually guard the nest. So time here, if you're going out, like diving somewhere, especially some of the pits in Southeast Kansas, that's what we would do. I was down at Pittsburgh State, and we would dive in the pits down there, and you could watch the sunfish guarding the nest. Um, it's pretty cool. So, okay, let's move on. So last family, or there's one, the perch family. This is the family that has the walleye in it. And so it's not, um, people call, a lot of things perch, it's a, the name, fish names are a mess and different parts of the country call different things, different fish, different names. So you never quite know what people are talking about, but a true perch is this fish right here, a walleye or a sauger, um, and the yellow perch is another one. And then with those bigger members, these smaller members, some of the most colorful fish, really cool to have in aquariums because they are tiny little fish with bright colors that uh, you can see very easily. But what makes them unique is they do not, the darters don't have that swim bladder. So they can't swim to the top of the water. That's why they live in shallow streams and in fast currents. So look at that fin shape. Look how those fins are out to the side. It kind of holds them down to the bottom. And uh, they eat tiny macroinvertebrates and things, but these are cool to have in the aquarium. And uh, we try to have a few on display at the nature center all the time. But most people will never see a darter unless you go sailing in a stream, unless you go out into a, a good clear stream that has good water quality. And uh, yeah, you have to have, like here at Conger, yeah. you're going to have some, some darters here. Flint Hill Stream. Have some good darter. Yeah, they're orange throat darters, I yeah. bet. Yeah. Um, so those are cool. And uh, but uh, so we have the perch, and there's only one more family in Kansas, and um, it's the drum family. And again, most drum are found in the ocean, but we do have this one called guess what? Called the freshwater drum. And, uh, but what's cool about the drum, they get a lot bigger than this. This, mount, this uh, mount right here isn't a very big drum, but um, it is a, 
a fish that's pretty commonly encountered. There are a couple things about the drum. They make, they get the name drum because they make a booming noise and they use some muscles against that air bladder that makes this booming sound. Um, but the other thing about the drum that people know is they have these bones in their head. They're called oolids and people use them to make jewelry with them. These little stones right here that you can get out of the drum. So, these are, I can hold up one, I guess. So that's real close. Yep, that's good. Okay. And then we can, so this is what people oftentimes will make jewelry out of these. You'll see them, I know it's come from drum. And uh, so that is the last of the fish. So I'm going to ask you. So which fish in Kansas has poisonous part? Yes. Yes. Is that part of the fish? I said, good night, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the gar eggs, yeah. Gar eggs are the poisonous part. Um, what do you think is the most abundant fish? This could be debate. Um, there could be much debate about this, but which is the most uh, abundant Kansas fish? Yeah. And, and, yeah. Gives a shed. Um, and then what is a mad dog? Remember that? Catfish. Catfish. And what is a white bird? Not bad. Um, it's a pretty diverse state. And the Gopher was our team, probably southeast corner of the state, all the way up to the east or the western part of the state. But the foothills is really the crown jewel, I would say, of uh, Kansas fisheries. Um, on, on that note, do we need to take a break? Yes. <laughs> but on that, thank you. Yes.